Hello and a very warm welcome to this Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics podcast. During this podcast we're going to be talking about laxatives and the anti-diarrheal agents. In particular I'm going to start by doing an overview of the important treatments that are available for both constipation and diarrhoea and then I'm going to use this to look at specific drugs, particularly the laxatives and anti-diarrheal agents. So let's start by having a basic overview of treatments that are available. Let's start with constipation. Now, as always, we divide up our management into conservative, medical and surgical. Conservative for both constipation and diarrhoea is very, very important and often will solve the problem. What's particularly important in the conservative management of constipation is that you need to know the cause for the constipation. And if you establish the cause for the constipation, you need to treat this. However, um, other things that can help in the treatment of constipation are um, encouraging fluid intake, fiber intake, um, and encouraging mobility. In addition, there are various um, uh, psychological approaches such as behavioral therapies and habit training that can also help. The medical section of the management of constipation is what we're going to concentrate mainly on in this podcast, and we're going to talk about lots of different laxatives. Note that laxatives may be used in both the acute situation and chronically um, for patients with, with real problems with their bowels. Acutely, um, often laxatives are given as a short course to get the bowels moving. And important examples here would be things such as Senna and Docusate. For patients with more chronic constipation, Senol, glycerol syrups and Fibrogel are all preferable. And finally, it's just useful to be aware of more sort of surgical techniques that may have a role. For example, the rather unpleasant uh, manual evacuation um, that may need to occur with um, faecal impaction that is resistant to the above therapies. Moving on to therapies for diarrhoea. As for constipation, um, we can divide into conservative medical and surgical, but here conservative is really, really important, particularly hydration. Um, if patients are losing lots and lots of uh, fluid as diarrhoea, this needs to be replaced either orally or in the hospital intravenously. It's also important to think of the underlying cause of the diarrhoea. Um, not all diarrhoea um, is infectious. Um, you need to think about things such as diabetic neuropathy, pancreatic insufficiency and bacterial overgrowth. And all of these things have their own uh, treatments that work um, quite well. In terms of the things we're going to talk about, we're going to mainly talk about the use of opioids in the management of diarrhoea, particularly the use of two um, drugs, codeine and um, loperamide. It should be noted that anti-diarrheal um, anti agents should be used um, for only the symptomatic relief um, of diarrhoea in uncomplicated acute diarrhoea in adults. And these agents aren't really suitable for use in children. So let's talk now about some specific classes of laxatives. There are five classes that I want to discuss, and this is how you should basically break them down. There are the bulk forming laxatives, stool softeners, stimulant laxatives, osmotic laxatives, and enemas. Let's start by talking about the bulk forming laxatives. And this is how I'm going to break down each of these sections. I'm going to first give some examples, then talk about the basic mechanism of action, talk about a possible use or a couple of uses, and then finally talk about the most important adverse um, or disadvantages to uh, using this particular class of agents. So under the bulk forming laxatives, we have things such as bran, fibre and husks. And the basic idea here is to increase the volume of the stool. If you increase the volume of the stool, there'll be more stimulation to the myenteric plexus, which surrounds the bowel, and there'll be more peristalsis, so things will get moving. These agents are typically used in very mild constipation, and they're really quite safe. In terms of the disadvantages, however, they usually have a very slow onset of action, maybe up to even over weeks. So these wouldn't be uh, appropriate to treat a patient who, say, was in uh, abdominal distress because of constipation, because they just take too long to start working. The most common side effect of these drugs is a bit of um, bloating. If we move on now to the stool softeners, these are agents such as liquid paraffin, arachis oil, and uh, sodium docusate. What these agents do is they facilitate the mixing of fat and water within the stool, and this makes it easier for the stool to move along the bowel. These agents are particularly useful 
in painful anal conditions such as anal fissures and anal hemorrhoids um, where constipation is a contributor to the condition. However, these agents tend not to be used so much nowadays because of the adverse effects such as faecal leakage. It's also important to note that often these agents need to be given in combination with other agents that I'm going to talk about. The third group of agents are the stimulant laxatives, and now you'll start seeing some of the things that you've probably seen written on uh, drug charts on the ward. These are things such as senna and picosulfate. As the name implies, these are stimulants, so they have a direct stimulatory effect on the myenteric plexus which surrounds the bowel and controls the movement of peristalsis. This results in an increased level of peristalsis. And the way that actually senna does this is it uh, is broken down within the bowel to irritant anthracene glycoside derivatives that actually cause physical irritation and chemical irritation to the myenteric plexus. These um, laxatives are usually used um, in a number of different settings. Senna typically is used, say, in uh, moderate constipation and has an action of onset for between 8 and 12 hours and is usually given at night. Picosulfate, on the other hand, is much more quick acting and has quite a quite a significant um, uh, effect on the myenteric plexus uh, and is used more in, say, bowel preparation prior to um, surgery or endoscopy. In terms of the adverse effect, as you might imagine, because of the way these drugs are working, they can cause quite considerable um, colic or abdominal uh, intestinal pain. Their chronic use um, may also lead to hypokalemia, um, so a low serum potassium, and more seriously, um, they can actually compound the problem by leading to colonic atony. The fourth group are the osmotic laxatives that include once again agents that act more quickly and agents that act more slowly. Um, magnesium salts are a whole group of osmotic laxatives that are once again used prior to surgery and endoscopy when uh, it's necessary for the bowel to be empty. And then the agent lactulose, which you'll probably be familiar with, tends to have a, a, an onset of action of about 48 hours. Basically, the way that these laxatives work is that they pull water into the bowel. This increases the bulk of the stool, just like those bulk-forming laxatives, and that increases peristaltic activity. And the reason that they do this is that these laxatives tend to, to be uh, poorly absorbed solutes. Um, such as fructose and galactose in the case of lactulose. These agents, once again, used in moderate constipation, so that's your lactulose, and your magnesium salts would be used, say, in bowel preparation. In terms of adverse effects, they can also lead to uh, particular problems with colic, and uh, particularly with the magnesium salts, uh, high levels of magnesium can also build up in the blood, which have effects on uh, other electrolytes as well. An important application of lactulose that it's worth highlighting is the use of lactulose um, in patients with liver disease, particularly in patients with liver disease and hepatic encephalopathy. Lactulose reduces the pH of the gut contents and thus reduces the number of ammonium-producing bacteria. This is important as it's thought that ammonium um, in hepatic encephalopathy acts as a false neurotransmitter in the brain, leading to the syndrome of the encephalopathy. Therefore, uh, lactulose is often used in, in patients with uh, severe liver disease. The final group of laxative agents are the enemas. And in, particularly the, in particular, there are two important ones, uh, glycerin suppositories and phosphate enemas. Um, glycerin suppositories um, provide direct lubrication to any impacted faecal material um, in the rectum and anus. Um, while phosphate enemas have both a lubricant and an osmotic effect and are used both in acute constipation and also in bowel preparation. You'll see both of these preparations used quite a lot, um, particularly in the hospital environment. So, let's finally talk just a little bit about some of the anti-diarrheal agents. As I mentioned earlier, all of the anti-diarrheal agents are opioids. They act at mu receptors in the myenteric plexus. This leads to reduced acetylcholine release and therefore reduced peristalsis. They also function by increasing anal tone. The two most important ones that you need to be aware of are codeine 
and loperamide. Loperamide is particularly important because it's an opioid that does not cross the blood-brain barrier, so it doesn't have any of the centrally acting effects of other opioids such as codeine um, and morphine. Codeine is usually given at a dose of uh, 40 milligrams, say two or three times a day, while the loperamide is usually given as a single four milligram dose, and then after each loose bowel motion as another two milligram dose. So that's it for this podcast. During this podcast, we've looked at the most important uh, modalities that can be used to uh, treat constipation and diarrhea. We've, and we've looked at some of the very specific agents, um, their mechanisms of action, examples, and their adverse profiles. And I'll see you all soon. Goodbye.